the cloud, Catherine. Well, welcome everyone that is able to join us this evening. Um, my name is Amanda Miller. I am the executive director of the South King Tool Library or Skittle, if you need a shorter name. Um, we're in Federal Way, Washington, and soon coming to Auburn as well. Um, and this is our one-of-a-kind building made out of recycled chipping containers. There's pictures of me with the chainsaw because that's my uh, tool of choice, apparently. Um, but we're presenting the class today along with Tilt Alliance, and I'll let Rosemary introduce the Tilt Alliance in a little bit. But just to give you some information about why we're here today, um, a big thank you to our uh, grant uh, grantors, the EPA HRSC Region 10 and the Washington Department of Ecology Public Participation Grant. Yeah. And I just wanted to invite you guys all to our upcoming events. If you are local, we have a gardening opportunity on this Saturday at the Woodmont Library. Um, a lot of other things you see here, upcycled terrariums. We have a clothing swap coming up in May. Uh, another virtual class on May 24th, Growing Food in Containers. And then our next repair cafe is June 10th. Um, let's see. And all of those events are also on our website at South King Tools with an S dot O-R-G. Uh, and then we have our great demonstration rain garden that you guys are welcome to visit any time. Uh, it's a totally accessible community rain garden, uh, growing native plants that are edible and good pollinators. And uh, it's just coming up, doesn't look quite this luscious yet, but it's, uh, it's working on, on it. <clears throat> and yeah, I just wanted to highlight some of our tools that can help you achieve your home, yard, landscaping, um, or, you know, maybe even just your uh, community garden goals that can help reduce waste, reduce consumption, uh, and be a better contribution to the environment. So we have all those tools you see on the screen there, electric versions of the lawnmowers, hedge trimmers, weed whackers, deed thatchers, that's very popular, and sawzaws or chainsaws as well. Uh, and then manual tools are always fun. And yeah, why don't you just skip the gym, cancel your membership, it costs too much. You can just get to manual tools uh, to borrow those for free and go out and uh, plant a whole native garden in your yard if, if that is what you're feeling that day. Um, but one of the great reasons that we are able to do this work is our partnership with the EPA and Department of Ecology, who has led us to being able to calculate a great contribution to the world, really, society. So borrowing those six tools just one time helps divert over 370 pounds of carbon uh, from being emitted into the atmosphere. Now that's the idea that instead of buying those things new, you borrow them. And it's just a great way to make the impact uh, in one fell swoop. Yeah. So the, that equivalent, uh, equivalency, is equal to 15 gallons of gas uh, or 150 pounds of coal, um, waste going into the landfill, uh, and even trees planted two and a half or 2.3 tree seedlings grown for 10 years. So it doesn't seem like you're making a big impact by borrowing instead of buying, but you really are. And yep, come by anytime, learn more about uh, really great programs that we have a lot of these classes that we'll be offering. And um, I'm excited because we're partnering with Silt again this year and they always have such great leaders and teachers and information. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and then let Rosemary kind of take over. Oh, you're muted. Hi, thank you for that. Um, hello everyone, my name is Rosemary Cullinane and I'm one of the garden educators at Tilth Alliance Natural Yard Care Program. Uh, we do a lot of outreach. Um, we have a garden hotline you can call in or email if you have gardening questions. And this time of year, we are getting a lot of questions about gardens and lawns 
uh, in particular. So the, I'm going to present on natural lawn care and uh, it's there's a lot of information so if you feel like taking notes um, but I understand you're recording it and you're going to post it is that right okay um, so you can review it um, but I got a slide presentation um, to help guide us through all the information that you'll need if you're going to um, maintain a garden in an ecologically responsible way because they are big consumers of resources um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen here. All right, so we'll start off. Um, again, here's our garden hotline information with our web our email, website, and our phone number. If ever you want to call us if you have uh, garden questions or lawn and landscape questions as well. Um, all right. And what is green landscaping in the Pacific Northwest? Our climate is unique um, to the rest of the country. We're considered uh, Mediterranean climate. Um, Sunset Western Gardener has us as a zone five. And I think on the US um, scale we have, I think we're an eight. Um, but let's talk about what, where to start uh, with your green landscaping and your, your lawns. And this first bullet point is soil. Healthy soil is the key to plant success. Uh, there's an adage that I like that says, when a flower uh, isn't doing well, you don't fix the flower, you fix the environment or the conditions in which it grows. And so soil is, I think, the biggest part of the environment for plants. Um, climate in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it's good to know what plants are native and what are some compatible exotics, as they call them. Uh, that will grow well here. Again, we're a Mediterranean climate. And then in your own space, in your own yard or your property, uh, choosing the right plants uh, at the right time to minimize the need for correcting problems. Uh, so the thing about native plants is that they're well adapted to our conditions. We have wet, cool uh, winters and springs, and we have a dry, uh, temperate winters, which is much like the Mediterranean. So our dry season is typically from May to October, and then the rain starts again in October, November. So the plants have adapted for those sort of drought-like conditions we get in the summertime. Uh, and because we get a lot of rain and we have a lot of coniferous plants, uh, we're very acid-loving soil here, or acid soil, and the plants are usually acid-loving. So choosing those right plants, compatible plants, is a big step in minimizing any future problems. So and then water right for your site, soil types, slopes, irrigation methods is something you want to consider. Growing a diverse garden to encourage beneficial insects and pollinate, pollinators. Biodiversity is you're attracting beneficial insects um, and the diversity uh, and pollen ecology, there's so much to say about biodiversity um, and a, it's just a well-balanced ecosystem. Uh, fewer problems with that. And then avoiding pesticides and chemical fertilizers to build healthy soils. And those chemical fertilizers are usually water soluble. And one of the things they do is once it starts raining, there's a lot of runoff and they leach into uh, the water. and I like to remind people that anything you put down on the ground is probably gonna end up in our water source, uh, including the Puget Sound, our drinking water, our groundwater, et cetera. All right, so a little bit about lawns in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, soils, our native soil is typically pretty clay, um, but there are amendments you can make to it, such as compost, uh, to make it a little bit more easy to work with. Um, and accommodate certain plants like lawns or turf. Um, climate in the Pacific Northwest, like I mentioned, is a Mediterranean climate. We're gonna talk a little bit about lawn maintenance, um, lawns and stormwater management, lawn renovation, special site considerations. Not everybody has a flat space. A lot of us, because we're so hilly here on the West Coast, we have a lot of slopes. And then lawn reduction and removal. You know, maybe you want to do something else besides a traditional 
turf lawn. Okay, so starting with soil, the value of healthy soil, it reduces the need for chemicals, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Um, if you have a well-balanced, healthy soil ecosystem, uh, it pretty is self, it's pretty self-sufficient. It reduces irrigation needs, filters out urban pollutants, um, sequesters stormwater, and stores carbon from the atmosphere. Okay, oh, sorry. All right, so soil components, a little soil science here. Um, you hear that word dirt, and dirt is really just inert things that don't really have much biota to them or biology to them. So you can break down soil components into three uh, areas here, sand, silt, and clay. And sand, as you know, it's like the stuff you see on the beach. It's very granular and water passes through it pretty quickly. Silt is very fine. It's kind of flower-like um, and that can be kind of sticky. And then clay, the structure of clay is really interesting. As you know, uh, it's kind of slippery when it's, when it's wet, but it, it, when it's dry, it gets really, really hard, just like the clay pots or any of the clay um, pottery that you see. Uh, it's really moldable uh, when it's wet, but then when it dries, and sometimes it can just be like very like rock hard. Um, so there's a combination of these mineral particles that make up soil and so knowing the soil structure, whether it's sand, silt, or clay is very useful and how to amend your soil a little later on here. Um, there's air and water in pore spaces, what we call aggregates, uh, those pockets uh, contain a lot of living organisms uh, and they create spaces for those, your plants roots to draw up water and other nutrients. Um, the organic matter and the soil life. So organic matter is really just decomposed plants and other things. Um, those help create the aggregates I was just mentioning and, and the pores of the soil. This is where you get a lot of um, living things in the soil. Uh, for every one cubic inch, there's over a billion different living organisms. So it's, it's a living thing. Soil is a living thing. All right, so good soil is about half mineral, half pore space and air water, plus a smaller but essential amount of organic matter and soil life. So it's a combination of all these things. And then loam is a mix of sand, silt and clay, or an organic formed over time by nature. If you ever take a walk in the forest and um, we refer to that loamy surface soil as duff and it's super rich and it's just a great combination of decomposed matter. Um, it smells really clean and sweet and yeah, it's good stuff. All right. so. How does that differ from disturbed soils and compaction? So usually this disturbed soil can happen through natural occurrences like um, uh, earthquakes might shift some land around, compact it. Usually it's human activity that's disturbed soil and compaction. Um, so that topsoil of layers removed, then heavy machinery or just, you know, going over a particular patch of earth over and over again. Uh, the subsoil or worse used to fill in layers, like they'll move it around uh, and you don't get anything that's really alive. And then we have toxins and that lack of biota. So toxins can be anything from runoff, um, point sources can be cars. I'm trying to think of some other things here. Um, just spills of all kinds uh, and the moving around of something contaminated um, over to another place. So there's lots of sources of toxins. 
Okay, and then a word about manufactured soils. Inputs are sourced from valuable sources. Uh, they can come from construction sites, can have certified organic components. They're not necessarily native soils. Um, if you go to a landscape supplier uh, for your soil, you can always ask for testing information and uh, what the makeup of that soil is. So that's good information to have and you, you can ask for that. So don't forget that. Um, soil testing is a great tool to determine your soil's health baseline, uh, what nutrients are lacking or you have an abundance of, or if it's good with organic matter. Uh, so it can assess your nutrient quality. Um, also, a soil test will provide guidelines for further amendments, amendments like if your pH is too uh, alkaline, you can add some lime to, um, to make it more acidic. Uh, it may uh, assess some toxin issues that you might need to address. Um, as you can see here, there's this list of houses built pre-1978 most of them will have lead. If you live in an old building or an old house, uh, you'll know you might have layers of lead paint um, underneath the latex or acrylic paint. Uh, old orchard grounds may have some arsenic, um, industrial sites, old substations, auto shops, leaded gasoline, other hydrocarbons as well. Uh, downwood to cement plants. Uh, Smelter plumes uh, can lead to arsenic, lead, and uh, cand cadmium. Um, also along a busy highway with heavy metals. And I just wanted to kind of throw something that's a little bit off the track here. I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues who's an agriculturist and he was telling me one of the wonderful things about organic gardening when you have really, really healthy organic soil is that there's a minimum to almost non-existent uh, heavy metals in the soil source, therefore it's not in the food source. All right, so that's kind of good to keep in mind. All right, so winter soil temperatures in the Pacific North, or say Western Washington, um, they range, uh, it depends on your microclimate. And what I mean by microclimate is not everybody in your neighborhood has the same, is always the same temperature or has the same topography. So you may have cold spots or warm spots in your yard that the person next to you doesn't. But I just wanna talk a little bit about why temperatures are important. Um, they help with a lot of things. Uh, warm soils will help with the nitrification where nitrogen is readily available to the plants. Um, it, Soil temperature also dictates the nutrient absorption, root growth, uh, and which, uh, which organisms are active or inactive. And as it, we warm up here, we go into summertime, there'll be a lot of activity. But I wanna also acknowledge that freezing is a good thing too. Uh, when things solidify and then when temperatures start to warm up, there's this thing called heaving and that heaving is a really great way to break up soil and create those aggregates and soil pores. But as you can see, we get on this, we've got up various soil temperatures, whether you're inland, um, on one side of the mountains near the Puget Sound, it will vary. All right, so um, federal way weather. Uh, I'm in Seattle and I believe Amanda, you're over in federal way. But just as an example, um, the average cumulative rainfall is 41 inches annually, where the hottest months are July, August, and September. Uh, August, we usually peak. Um, usually we get two or three days of 90 degree weather in August, but I think last summer, if anybody remembers correctly, we had a, quite a long stretch of that. So climate change is happening. Um, and then, I was going to say there's microclimates even in federal way when you're yeah. closer to the waterfront or even on a lakefront, you know, we have a lot of lakes. So we're absolutely yeah. too well versed in the microclimate. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right. Um, and that's a, a kind of a thing you can observe in your own backyard, you know, um, where are my hot and cold spots? Uh, June rain and cloudy days preceding summer. What's the 
saying here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, summer starts after the 4th of July, because it usually rains on the 4th of July. And then April and September, October, optimum for growing grasses and lawns. It's a little cooler, um, so that helps. All right, so lawns and storm water. Now this is, this is important. Um, everything you apply, like I said before, to your property has the potential to get into local, local waterways. So we have to be mindful of that. Fertilizers, pesticides, uh, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, uh, all used on lawns in the garden. Uh, they'll leach eventually. Um, the synthetics leach particularly uh, quicker than the organic, at least with the organic, it's slow release. The plants take up what they need. Um, it lingers in the soil for much, much longer. Um, but the synthetics are the ones that really leach very quickly. Uh, it minimizes the use of any type of chemical application. It's minimizing the use of, excuse me, any type of chemical application is encouraged. Um, so we're usually when we're working in the garden, there's a lot of mechanical methods that we use to control weeds um, and pests and even pathogens. Um, so garden chemicals reduce soil life diversity. Uh, they don't really add structure uh, to soil. Um, they contribute to the compaction of the soil. They make soil structure weak and easily compactable. Uh, they increase soil acidity. That's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, and increase thatch buildup in your lawn and thatch is that layer um, right above the root system that's very matted and dense and it it's sort of how do i put this it um, it's it's difficult for the grass blades to grow or thicken up um, it's kind of a tangled mess and it really helps to dethatch every season to get rid of it um, but it's very, I usually, oh, go ahead. Describe it as, I usually describe it as suffocation because it's yes. not, yeah, it's a little congested. Doesn't even really do the, yeah. the right, but yeah, <laughs> suffocating. Yes, it is. It really does, uh, suffocate the, the lawn, um, and, uh, too much nitrogen, uh, and phosphorus in our waterways increases algae growth in lakes, which reduces oxygen levels in water and kills fish and amphibious animals. And here in the Puget Sound, we have five species of endangered salmon. In addition to, you know, fertilizers leaching, you know, we have other things like, you know, that pass through our water filtration systems that are not perfect. So things like your, 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 the caffeine in your coffee gets in there, um, you know, everything. So I just wanted to kind of give you a sort of ecological map here. I don't have a diagram. So on a, I'll just describe it. That by the time a toxin goes through our local ecosystem, gets into the Puget Sound, it passes um, through the aquatic plants like eelgrass and kelp. Um, it can get absorbed by copepods, those little tiny jellyfish-like creatures that live in the vegetation um, and in the herring, eat those copepods. And who eats the herring? The salmon do. And who eats the salmon? The orcas and humans. And so by the time it cycles through that food web, uh, it becomes one million times more toxic than it was at its original point source. And then it metabolizes through it over and over and over again, increasing that um, uh, more toxicity, you know, a million times by a million times. So it kind of just demonstrates how uh, potent the toxicity can be. Um, and then downstream effects are seen in the Puget Sound. So everything we throw down in the ground eventually will end up in our sound in the ocean. All right, I didn't mean to be um, Debbie Downer about that, but there's the reality of what we do yeah, through human activity. All right, so um, one thing we do here at the Tilth Alliance Natural Yard Care is we answer questions regarding hazardous has disposal, and I just wanted to pop this in that to minimize those toxins, um, there's a program where you can take your hazardous waste 
to one of the hazardous waste sites. Um, there's one in North Seattle, South Seattle, uh, I think just past Soto, one in Bellevue at Victoria, and a waste mobile uh, in Auburn near the Nordstrom Rack loading dock. Uh, we, King County Hazardous Waste also has a roving waste mobile, and you can check their website to see when a, the roving waste mobile will be in your area. Um, but the nice thing about hazardous waste is that you can take a lot of those things like pesticides you can take, fertilizers you can take, um, oils, gasolines. Um, you can take those things to hazardous waste. And if in your household, you don't have to pay, they're free because your utility bill will pay for that. Um, people who have businesses, they're allowed four annual visits per year. Uh, there is a little bit of paperwork they need to fill out before they visit the King County Hazardous Waste Disposal Sites, but it's all on their website at kingcountyhazwaste.wa.gov. Um, but you can call the garden hotline um, or the hazardous waste uh, helpline and they'll patch you through to us and we can help you with, you know, hey, I have something. I'm not sure if it's hazardous waste. Can I take it? And we'll help you figure that out. It's a really great service. Okay, so what is a lawn? So lawns are, are grasses um, here in the Pacific Northwest. Those are like fescues, rye um, that tend to grow well here. Um, so it's many individual plants. Each blade of grass is a little plant. Um, they do like to grow tall in the lawns that we see in our landscapes. They never really grow tall enough to go to seed and they'll get a few feet tall. And yeah, they look like other grasses like wheat or riley, or excuse me, rye and barley. I said <laughs> two words in one there, excuse me. Um, uh, good competitors when they're healthy, um, permeable when they're healthy. Uh, yes, they're heavy feeders. And yes, they do require some water. Um, we'll talk about uh, fertilizing and watering here in a minute. Uh, some of the basics are they do need, most turf grasses need full sun, about six to eight hours. Uh, they need well-draining soil. They need regular watering, regular mowing, and you're not going to go too short. They need regular nutrition. And yes, you do need to watch for things like pests, like crane fly is one. Weeds, weeds will creep in if you don't have a dense growth of turf. Um, and disease management. Um, there are things like red thread, um, which is a virus, which we'll get into. All right, so lawns and light, we'll start here. Uh, again, they prefer full sun, again, six to eight hours a day. Uh, so a good thing to do in your yard um, is a lot of people are calling in about moss problems in their lawn, and that's usually your lawn is in the shade. Um, so you check for variations in exposure. Your mossy areas usually indicate you have shade. Uh, thin grass may mean, again, shady areas. And you just notice how the sun tracks across your lawn or your yard to get an idea of where a good place for a lawn might be. So you'll evaluate if there's enough light to grow a healthy lawn. All right, so drainage is a really important thing. That's just for lawns, but for most plants, um, Root depth, uh, most turf grasses, at, at least eight inches of good soil to 12 inches will accommodate most root depth. Some turf seeds can get up to five feet deep. Um, so that's pretty far down. Uh, Non-compacted sandy loam is usually best for most turf seeds. And consider subsoil quality sometimes cannot be changed. Uh, for example, if you've got a slab of granite underneath your clay and it's really, it, you may not be able to go a lawn there. So that's something to consider. Um, avoid sharp horizons where soil profile changes abruptly causing pooling of water. So at the bottom of a slope, for example, something to consider. Okay, now drainage for lawns, aeration. Um, so aeration means you're creating uh, these little holes or divots or little pockets 
uh, where air can get in. Um, aeration, aerate annually for every two years. Fall is an ideal time to aerate, like uh, restoring your lawn in general in the fall is a great idea, but it can be done in the spring. Uh, you can use a handheld aerator, which has got this two prong tines that punch out little holes from the lawn. Um, the hand ones are great for small lawns, but they have power aerators for large lawns that you can rent. Yes. Um, you can also hire a company to come by every year to aerate your lawn, makes it quick and easy. Um, so the plugs you can just leave on the lawn to decompose. So there's another benefit of aerating. And then you'll overseed and spread your compost after pulling the lawn. So seed first, and then you'll spread your compost. All right. So drainage and thatch. So again, the thatch, as you can see on the diagram, it's just below the crowns of the lawn, just right underneath the uh, blades of grass and right above the soil. This is the part that is suffocating, as Amanda describes. So thatch is a normal layer of the grass stems, roots, and weed material at the base of the grass in the lawn, but it becomes a problem when it accumulates faster than it can decompose. All right, so too much thatch, like a half an inch, can block water and decrease benefits of grass clippings or fertilizer. Um, dethatch only if needed. Um, so you'll know you need to dethatch when your lawn's kind of thin um, and you have a lot of weeds. Uh, weeds are super opportunistic. Nature doesn't like bare ground, uh, so the weeds will come in. Um, cool season grasses don't build up thatch that quickly. Power equipment and handheld tools are available to use to aerate and dethatch and you can hire companies to dethatch. Um, there's a, also a metal rake like this in the picture is really good to use if you have a small lawn, but you may, you can put a dethatching attachment on your lawnmower as well. And it's just two metal tines that spin around with the blades and they'll dethatch the lawn as well. Okay, uh, drainage, overseeding and top dressing. This is sort of the process of restoring your lawn. So after you aerate to improve drainage and create um, some pockets, air pockets, uh, you're gonna even, even without aeration and thatching, you should mow the lawn first. That's your first step. Um, spring or fall, when the weather is cool and wet, grass season. You can also do one or not the other. You can either aerate or dethatch. Um, and you can also add a slow release organic lawn fertilizer at this time with the seed. So you're gonna aerate and dethatch, then you're gonna put down your seed and fertilizer, and then you're gonna top dress with compost. And then you rake it in, work it in evenly, as they're showing here. All right, so top, Step to top dress the lawn. After you've laid down the seed, your fertilizer, um, you're gonna pick up any rocks, sticks, <laughs> dog toys, etc., and you're gonna mow the lawn. You're gonna rough up the soil with a rake and apply seed using a chemical spreader or broadcaster for large areas, or you can do it by hand, just broadcast by hand by sowing the seed across your area. Uh, seed bags have suggested rates per square foot, so you'll read the directions on the bag or the package for the grass type. You can apply extra seed to compensate for birds, wind, and drying out. All right, so you overseed a little bit. You can apply compost over the top seed, about one-fourth inch of compost. Uh, you spread the compost with the back of a fan-shaped fan leaf rake to move the compost so you don't disturb the seed too much. And then water daily to keep the seed best bed moist. And this is critical because once that seed dries out, it will not germinate. All right, so watering. Um, I think that's a big question is how much watering to do um, and when to do it. And uh, typically uh, during the, we want our lawns to be green during the summer. Um, here's the tricky part about that, is that turf naturally goes dormant in the summer. So the fact that your lawn turns brown, that's not due to 
neglect so much is that's just what it does. And ironically, we want it to be green right when it wants to go brown. But if you want it to be green, if you insist, um, you're gonna water one inch per week to six inch depth into soil during the growing season. So what that means is you're gonna water deeply. Um, you can measure this by using a tuna can, an empty tuna can to test your watering system. Um, and you're gonna check to see how long it takes to accumulate one inch of water. Um, you can cut a test strip to see if the water is penetrating into the soil six inches and choose the watering system that works best for you, for your lawn, um, for your budget, time, and area. Uh, sprinkler systems are great for large areas. If you have a small one, I think there's a pleasure and joy in getting a rain wand and just watering your lawn in the evening or in the early morning. Okay, so when to water. Early morning is ideal, the reason why. Um, usually there's less wind in the morning, so therefore less drift, less evaporation in the cooler temperatures and gives grass to dry off after a watering. Um, hydrates for hot, the hot part of the day, less disease pressure and less conflict with use of the lawn. Um, so you wanna water to, uh, as far as when, you should start watering before your lawn turns brown. Um, so I think um, we're right at the end of our rainy season. I think by the end of May, early June is a good time to start watering before your lawns turn brown. Once they turn brown, it's kind of an uphill battle. All right, uh, so mowing the lawn. Mowing height is about two to three inches minimum to outcompete weeds, shade soil, and conserve moisture. Grass cycling is great. You let your clippings just fall back. You remove the bag. You just let the grass clippings into the lawn to feed it. They'll de decompose pretty quickly and they're full of nitrogen, which is essential for lawns. Um, there are lots of different types of mowers. There's the electric hand push reel mowers and small gas powered um, mowers and tractors that, as mentioned, Men says the hand push reel mowers are a good workout. All right, so fertilizing the lawn. Um, so a good organic fertilizer is what we recommend. Uh, use a natural slow release organic based lawn fertilizer instead of chemical fertilizers. Ingredients list include recognizable products like alfalfa meal, feather meal, uh, maybe some blood or bone meal. Uh, now no phosphorus is allowed in lawn fertilizers unless your soil test shows a phosphorus depletion. This is to protect waterways. So there's a law now that says that these can't contain phosphorus anymore. Um, so it's contributing to the algae bloom. So uh, you may want to check the labels. Um, anytime you use a fertilizer, pesticide, herbicide, the label is the law. So make sure you're reading the directions properly. You can, um, again, grass cycling reduces need for fertilizer fertilization to one application in the fall. Uh, test your soil to assess nutrient needs. That's always a good idea. You can go to King Conservation District to get soil testing done. They've got a great website. You can click on soil tests and they'll tell you how to get that done. Lime is added to increase pH of soil. Lawns prefer a little more alkaline soil if it's too acidic. Uh, compost supplies some nutrients when top dressing. But mostly the compost is great for soil structure. Okay, a little bit about adding lime. So lime supplies calcium, agricultural lime also supplies calcium, dolomite, dolomitic lime, calcium, and magnesium. Soil tests will help you determine which is better and also how much is needed to adjust the lime. Again, King Conservation District offers free soil tests. That's a great resource. Uh, calcium is leached into the lower soil levels below grassroots in the winter and apply lime after aerating if you need to to get it into the soil or apply in the fall. 
Lyme increases earthworm populations and helps improve soil structure. Earthworm populations are a real bonus for healthy soil. Okay, um, and then kind of looping back to lawn renovation, you'll follow the same steps for aerating, dethatching, top dressing, and overseeding the lawn as needed. Often done in patches where needed, can involve removing persistent weeds that are dominating the lawn, and sometimes requires a full lawn replacement. That's a big job. Um, so new lawns, um, you can do sod, which is a faster finish lawn, a little bit of instant gratification there. It is a little bit more expensive. It's heavy to work with. It's, um, the soil profile on sod can differ from your own soil. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, and you can hire someone to install it for you. Now seed takes weeks to fill in. Uh, weed pressure is higher. Uh, no heavy sod to handle. Can be a lot less expensive, but you'll need to tend to it and water daily until the grass fills in. So you have to weigh the pros and cons on both options there. So how to install a seed lawn. Okay, so clear your area of any plant material. You're gonna add fresh topsoil and you'll level the area. Uh, you'll apply seed with a mechanical spreader to broadcast it. Um, you apply extra seed, a little bit more to compensate for birds, wind and drying out. Applying compost over the top of the seed, a quarter inch. Half an inch is fine too. Um, you'll spread the compost with the back of a fan-shaped leaf rake to move the compost so you don't have to disturb the seed too much and you're gonna water daily to keep the seed bed moist. You will not go on vacation <laughs> with this. I think you can start a lawn in the spring, but it's a lot easier in the fall when the rains come back, particularly with that watering daily. And you're just gonna keep a close eye on the amount of rainfall when it's raining, and if there's a day um, we don't get a lot of precipitation, you'll be out there watering. Okay, and how to install a sod lawn. Again, clear the area of any plant material, fresh topsoil, level the area, you'll roll it out, um, you stagger the stems, or the, excuse me, the seams, so the area um, has fewer long edges. You can cut the pieces to fit with a handheld boon um, edger or horary knife. Uh, you'll knit the edges together with a pitchfork um, or you just dig it right, dig right in. Overseed along the seam edges with a matching seed that helps and then top dress the seams with topsoil or compost and then water daily uh, for the first, it, oh, we cut off here, say for the first season, if not that first year, or until the rains come. Sorry about the cutoff there. Um, all right, so grass varieties for the Pacific Northwest. When you go looking for seed uh, in the nurseries, landscape supplies, garden centers, these are the varieties that work for Western Washington. Um, perennial ryegrass a minimum of six hours of sun, it's winter hardy, nice deep green, it's dense and disease resistant. So it's usually resistant to things like red thread. Fescues, they're drought resistant, more shade tolerant, about five to six hours of direct sun. Deep root systems, not good for septic drain fields. Keep that in mind, okay? Uh, needs a little less Oxygen is great for play area. It's tolerant to foot traffic. Kentucky bluegrass is used as a filler in grass seed blends or mixes. It's not persistent in the Pacific Northwest, but it's a limited shade tolerance. It's kind of high maintenance, uh, vulnerable to heat, drought, and stress. But again, they usually use it as a filler. Okay, some lawn alternatives, clover, it provides nitrogen for the lawn. Clover is used as a cover crop for your um, bare uh, garden beds uh, as nitrogen, uh, it fixes the nitrogen in the soil. It stays green in drought conditions. It knits a lawn together. So if you don't mind clover mechs in the lawn, 
Um, it does flower, uh, so you will get bees, um, but it provides uh, food for bees. And uh, sometimes it's included in lawn seed blends. So you're gonna read the labels. And if that's not your desired look, make sure it doesn't have any clover listed. Okay, all right, so we kind of mentioned red thread before. So one of the lawn diseases is red thread. It's a virus. Um, it's seen in the fall in the Pacific Northwest. It's moisture and humidity encourages once it's established. It stresses lawns out or more likely to be, stress out lawns are more likely to be infected. Um, it doesn't kill the lawn, but it does have, it's unsightly. It causes cosmetic damage. And if you get real close to the lawn and you see some brown grass blades mixed with this sort of pinkish red, you know you've got red thread. Now, here's the thing about red thread. Um, you will track it in on your shoes. Um, it's really contagious. It's kind of unavoidable, but what you can do is add an application of nitrogen to slow it down and keep the lawn well hydrated during the summer to prevent it. Um, but again, it's just one of those things. It just, it, we all track it around and uh, it's just kind of hard to manage that way. All right, another thing, lawn pests. So there's a few lawn pests and we're gonna start with the larger <laughs> of the lawn pests. But I want to also change people's perspectives too about some of these pests really aren't pests, but usually they're signs of a healthy ecosystem. So moles, although they leave these unsightly chimneys, they're there for a really good reason. Subterranean, uh, they excavate tunnels for living quarters and feed on soil insects. So if you have moles or voles, that's usually a good sign that you have some biodiversity in your soil. The good news is they'll eat some of those pests like grubs or um, crane fly larvae, which are not great for lawns. They move into different levels depending on where, where the soil is moist and where the food is. Uh, beneficial aspects, they mix the soil, they aerate, they eat the crane fly larvae and the European chafer larvae and slugs. They are difficult to manage and deter. Um, uh, some people will trap them and another option is to tolerate them. Now, one thing you can do is you can stomp on those chimneys and kind of work the soil into the lawn and level them out. That usually will cause the moles to move on. Um, you just have to be persistent with that method. But here's a link in case you wanna know some more about uh, moles and managing them. Okay, crane fly. Now, you, uh, those are the big, big mosquito looking things. You'll see them all over the place in the summertime. Their larvae eat the roots of the lawn and they cause brown patches. So if you've got these sudden yellowing brown patches in your lawn, you can take a look underneath the turf and see if you can find some larvae. Um, they feed on the decaying matter in the soil and the grass roots, the lawns will recover from the damage, um, but you may need to take a sample in uh, to have it diagnosed. And uh, Washington State University has a crane fly um, info on there. But again, you'll see sort of this brownish or yellowish patches in your lawn. So sampling for crane fly larvae, here's what they look like. You just cut a patch out and take a look right underneath the turf to see if you can find those larvae. Um, so you can cut a patch out of measure six by six and cut the edges on all three sides with a sod knife or a sharp spade. And you'll pull it back and you're just gonna look for those larvae. Um, the average number of crane fly per foot is zero to 25. Uh, do nothing, fertilize appropriately. You may need to treat the turf if it's young uh, not well established or with poor root structure. If you're finding 25 to 50, if your lawn is vigorous and healthy, you don't need to do anything. Decisions are based on the health of the turf, your personal tolerance, location used in the turf. Um, if you've got up to 100, close to 100, you're gonna treat the crane flight problem and you'll look for long-term solutions such as replacing 
problem area with more another patch of turf or lawn, you can move it up. You can also add beneficial nematodes to the area as well. Those will help control crane fly larvae. Okay, so treating, prevention, mow regularly, keep thatch levels down, aerate the lawn, grass cycling, let lawn go dormant, just let it go brown. Um, the more you water, the more habitat you're creating for crane fly larvae. Water deeply to encourage deep root systems, which tolerate some damage. And what I want, what do you mean by watering deeply is you'll water longer periods of time, less often. Uh, that period where you're not watering after you've watered deeply will encourage roots to search for water. Therefore, they will go deeper. Deep roots are uh, make strong turf. So treatment, you encourage birds in your yard. Um, this will help to reduce the population of crane fly. You can encourage black beetles. Um, they'll also help. You can apply predatory nematodes like I just mentioned. Um, must time the presence of larvae with proper soil temperatures and the correct species of nematode is important. So when you go shopping for beneficial nem nematodes, you'll get those nematodes that are great for crane fly. Um, and then you have to apply it during the right weather conditions, temperature. Every time she wasn't, she saw it. I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? I couldn't hear. Sorry, now I think somebody just joined and I just muted them. Oh, that's okay. No worries, I thought there might've been a question or a comment there. I was okay. adding some of the links to the chat, by the way. So if anybody wanted to see those, so. Uh, okay, great. Um, Plant pests, European uh, Schaefer beetle. Uh, this is another one. Uh, the larvae feed on grass roots in the soil, just like the crane fly larvae do. Most damage happens in the spring as it transitions it to adult. Um, it's active in the fall and the spring. So this is a good time to look for them if you're noticing brown or yellow patches on your lawn. Uh, pupation is in May and the adults swarm in June at sunset and begin to lay eggs. First identified at SeaTac in 2015, so this is a relatively new pest, but has moved further out since then. Hydrated lawns are more resistant. Encourage birds in the lawns. Again, birds are great beneficials. Um, if you report, have a sighting, if you see a sighting, you, you can report it so we can monitor their spread, their range, and their numbers at this website. Um, and that helps entomologists figure out what's going on. All right, so lawns and weeds. Weeds will outcompete lawn if conditions for healthy lawns are not met. Improve the health of your lawn to overcome weeds and understand conditions that your problem weeds thrive in. Uh, corrective measures will include mowing high, two inches to shade out weeds and seedlings, um, not letting weeds go to seed, um, as you know, dandelions, um, once they go to seed, they really spread. Uh, aerating, dethatching, and top dressing improve soil conditions. We are going to emphasize that over and over again. Removing lawn from areas where it cannot thrive and tolerating some weeds or adding clover or clover adds nitrogen to the soil. Um, again, I think there's a thing too, there's this great, you should look up, read the weeds. Um, weeds are undesirable, yes, but they're really good information. And if you look up weed the reeds, it tells you about what's going on with your soil. Like there might be a nutri uh, nutrient deficiency or soil structure issues. Um, so that's a really good thing is to get to know what's going on in your lawn and reading those weeds are really good indicators of what's going on with your soil. All right, some of the common uh, lawn weeds, dandelion, plantain, buttercup, mosses, cat's ear, clover, self heel, and sheep sorrel. Okay, a lot of these weeds are edible. They were brought over from Europe as medicinals um, and uh, food sources. Um, and many of them are companionable with lawns. So if you can tolerate some, a lot of people like buttercup, buttercup. The buttercup is usually an indicator that you have a lot of water or soggy soil area. Um, okay, daisies, 
um, yarrow, ground ivy, annual bluegrass, speedwell, and tall fescues, these clumps. Um, these are all good, good information of what's going on with your soil. Um, but if you want to remove them, we highly recommend by hand and just restoring your lawn and your soil conditions. Moss. Yeah, there was a question. There was a question about <clears throat> chemicals for weeding. Do you want to talk about oh. that just for a second? Yeah, so managing weeds, um, mm -hmm. we'll always advocate for mechanical and cultural methods of moving weeds, so pulling them by hand. You know, there's a number of really good hand weeders that you can use, just get one that you like. Um, uh, removing them by hand, uh, overseeding your lawn and creating a healthy uh, ecosystem for turf. Um, we try to avoid the herbicides, um, We'll get into more about that in weeds here in a, a minute, but just an overview is there are things like horticultural vinegar, which you can use to control weeds. Um, and if you have to use the herbicides, you're gonna spot treat and not broadcast. Um, so we'll say no to weed and feed, but just spot, up, like spot apply the herbicide. All right, so getting back to the mosses, um, we live in the Pacific Northwest. It's kind of hard to get around this, but if you got a shady lawn, you're probably gonna have some moss. So you can rake it out as shown here. Um, but moss has its place in the ecosystem too. Uh, it requires changing the conditions that encourages it to grow. So fertility of the soil, grass cycling and fertilize, the acidity of soil, you to make it more alkaline, you can put lime. Uh, compaction of the soil, you can aerate and top dress with compost, uh, shade on the lawn, pruning, remove the grass, maybe plant something else instead. Excessive moisture in soil, you can aerate to help with the drainage and evaluate if it can be changed. But moss is used by local birds to build nests. And in the spring, hummingbirds build their tiny nests from lichens, moss, and spider silk. So um, mosses are native here and they're part of the ecosystem. All right, so uh, here we go with managing the lawn weeds. So some tolerance is helpful. Uh, so tolerate a certain amount of weeds that can grow companion companionably use hand tools to remove, ideal when the soil is wet and when they're young, spot spray for safer products will kill grass around the weed. Best weed management tactic is to grow a healthy lawn that can outcompete weeds and especially evaluating condition in your lawn every season um, that your lawn's growing in. Okay, so lawns are not always appropriate. Uh, so some places, where lawns are in the wrong place are slopes, uh, no more than 12% grade. Ponding indicates a compaction of high water table. Under conifers, shade, tree roots, needles, water availability, shady garden, lawns. Again, need about six to eight hours of sun daily. Okay, so if you're wanting to remove the lawn, whether you're gonna plant another garden of some kind, or restore it, uh, you can use a sod cutter. Uh, you can do it by hand with a half moon edger or shovel, or you can hire somebody. Uh, I have done this method uh, with a half moon edger before. That's a lot of work, but again, it's a good workout. Um, they don't recommend this. Uh, I think this is a tiller. Is that right? For yeah, it looks target. like it has. It has a multiple blade tiller. Yeah. Okay. The other one is a saw cutter. So yes. Just cutting this the sides and rolling it up. Yeah. So that's easier, right? Right. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, another thing you can do is solarize. You can do a sheet mulch. Like you can use cardboard and newspaper, and just over time, this will just get rid of the um, sod the and the turf. Um, and then you can plant whatever you wish. Uh, 
but this is a pretty effective method. Again, it does take time. It can take several months to a whole, you know, season or two to do this, but you'll add layers of newspaper and cardboard and more newspaper and cardboard, and then you'll just mulch right over it with some wood chips. Um, again, that's one way to get rid of it. It's probably the easiest, but it's the most time consuming. Okay, and then some alternative lawn choices to consider for Northwest Gardens, EcoTurf. Um, that's a really good one. I, it's a little bit expensive. Um, it's good for small spaces. It's, you don't have to mow it. It's pretty low maintenance. White clover, uh, people like it. Some people hate it. Just be mindful. It does attract bees. So if that's something you're uh, not wanting to do, uh, or if you have people with allergies to bee stings, it's not necessarily desirable. Um, baby tears is a nice ground cover. Creeping thyme is another one with those pretty flowers. Uh, steppable ground covers, there's so many different kinds of those. You can go to your nurseries and check out those steppable ground covers to see which ones you like. Uh, uh, and then some of the native grasses that we have are good as well. All right, tools for the lawn to do the lawn work. Um, a metal rake, a half moon spade or shovel. This is your aerator, a metal rake. Um, a, a detaching rake, a metal rake, um, a hori hori knife, and I, I don't know what you call this. Does somebody know? Uh, it's just another it type of like a grout knife, almost. A grout, but it, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's definitely like a kind of uh, um, pruning uh, blade, but yeah, or like a grafting, grafting blade. Yeah. Yeah. Something so like yeah, but you can. I think you can use that for weeding and for um, cutting cutting sod mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So if you have questions, I'm going to look at the chats here in a minute. There's a lot of them because I can't see it through my PowerPoint here. But I there's, just want you to oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say there's not too many. I put a lot of the links that you were in your spreadsheet into the um, chat as you were talking, just so that was easy okay. um okay thank you but yeah i all can't right. uh yeah go ahead sorry all right oh no that's fine so you can always call us at the garden hotline ecologically sound lawn care is a good site natural lawn care we have these um natural lawn care brochures and you can find them on the garden hotline website um for natural yard care natural lawn care um king county honey i shrunk the lawn video should be on there also, Hazardous Waste Management Program in King County and Seattle Public Utility have a lot of yard care and gardening uh, pages on their site. Uh, Snow Collie Valley Master Gardeners for Lawn Care, and in fact, any of the county master gardeners through Washington State University's extension co-op, cooperative extension are available. And then King County has a source um, for native plants if you're interested in learning more about native plants for low maintenance gardening. All right. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, um, there's a lot of information there mm -hmm. regarding plant care, but you'll have questions along the way and we're here to help in, you know, if you need, um, it's just a lot to remember, but we can always go over with it with you step by step on, on how to make sure your, your lawn is healthy, if you're replacing it or restoring it. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. If anybody had any specific questions, I can, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for just so much information. It was fabulous. I'm going to stop the recording. So anybody who wants to unmute can do that, but thank you. We're going to um, post this to our, our YouTube and share in our newsletter. So anybody that's missed it can definitely log in and you can watch it again too, because there's so much information. Um, Mm-hmm.